Welcome to the Think Fitness Life podcast, where the mind and gym come together to help you live your best life. Hosted by two fitness professionals and your personal trainers, Matt Gluckman and Eric Menchie. Is this thing on? Just kidding. We are back once again to the Think Fitness Life podcast, and this week we have an interview with Michael Rosas that I got to conduct. He is my training manager at Excel Fitness here in Utah. But before I debrief on that and lead us into the intro, Eric and I have our weekly workout and our food for thought. Eric, would you like to tell them what their weekly workout is? a lot of reps. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it is. Squats. Inverted rows, push-ups, sit-ups. Start at 20 reps, work your way down to one rep. So you're going to go 20 rep squat, 20 rep inverted row, 20 rep sit-up, 20 rep push-up. Take your breathe, breath work, whatever you need, time to recover, and repeat 19. Then we're 18, and all the way down to one. Total, what would you say, total 210 reps? Her about the 210 movement. reps of, of each individual exercise, and it basically comes down to 840 reps total. And this is one where, where you're doing it body weight, you're gonna go through it pretty quick. It, I mean, that's a lot, it's a lot of reps, right? It's a lot of volume. You're gonna hit fatigue, but it's, it's work, it's not gonna take you over an hour, it's gonna be a solid heart no. rate condition, conditioning program with body weight strength built in endurance built in i find the most difficult part is the beginning just getting through those the rounds of 20 and the round of 19 that's the idea of the 20 to 1 by the way just so people aren't confused is you start with 20 reps and you work your way down each round is the rep numbers that you're going to do for that round so you start with 20 complete then you go to 19 then 18 so on and so forth until you're down to one so the rounds of 20 to even 15 are really challenging. And it does take a lot of discipline and mental toughness to just keep pushing through. Because seriously, once you get to 15, it's a little bit more standard. And then when you get to 10, it's it's a breeze compared to what you were doing. So stick with it. It definitely has a, um, a reverse exponential difficulty to it, I find. But it's so rewarding. It is. It is a good one. And our our food for thought this week, um, we, we, we've been trying to make our food for thought applicable to what the person we were interviewing um, kind of represented, or maybe they gave us a favorite quote and we kind of picked something that was similar to that. So Mike had a really good quote um, that I'll let, I won't divulge now that I'll let you hear in the interview, but I, I chose the food for thought to be Enjoy the little things in life. For one day, you may look back and realize they were actually the big things. I think it's a really good quote that applies. But, um, you know, a little bit of history on Mike. He started coaching back in 2000, 2001. And he specialized, he was a, he has his degree in athletic training from uh, University of Wyoming or University of, of Mary, I think, actually, in Wyoming. But um, he's gone on to do his CSCS, his NASM. He's done Czech uh, trainings. He's been to the Czech Institute a couple times. He's done level one and level two over there. And he just has a really good in-depth understanding of this field from – the sports side of things all the way to the personal training and general population side of things, injury rehabilitation, pre-physical therapy, um, again, injury prevention, working with developing mentally disabled individuals. And it's just really fun to talk to. I'm sure you feel the same way, Eric, but just talking to people in our field that have been here longer than us, it's just so much fun to, hear their stories, hear their perspective, pick their brain. And I really enjoy talking to Mike. He's one of the best managers I've worked for. And I, I always am learning something new when I talk to him. 
And I, I really feel like I got a chance to actually learn more about him and his background here. And I think this is just going to be one of um, maybe a couple of interviews because he has just a wealth of knowledge being in the field for um, close to about 20 years. And he just has a lot of stories. He's, you know, Eric and I love movement, the book movement by Gray Cook. And, and um, you know, we, we talk about pendulum theory and joint by joint theory, which was developed by Mike Boyle. And he's literally like hung out with Mike Boyle and, and Gray Cook and like had a beer with them. So he has a lot of good stories that we didn't really get into, get the chance to dive into quite yet. But we got to really talk about kind of transitioning through the field um, from sports to keeping a roof over your head by making a living and, and, and helping the general population. Um, and I think everyone's going to really enjoy this interview. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, to have, have someone that kind of experience and met the met those people. It's like, you know, people get and gain a wealth of knowledge by being around some of these people. You know, you always talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. And that's kind of what this industry, kind of what the world is, right? Now you're, you're standing on people who had past experiences and influences in this field. So we're talking about some of the most influential people. Yeah, I want to I wanna hear what he's got to say. And I could only imagine sitting, sitting down and having, you know, having a drink with some of my mentors, like... That'd be it's insane. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you said that about different things that they experienced because he, um, I forget what the drug was, but he did like his um, senior thesis on, oh man, I don't want to butcher it, but it's like androgenes phosphate or something the, the drug that um barry barry bonds sammy sosa and um mark mcguire were using as for perform for performance really? enhancing and yeah and what was cool is like he was literally doing this thesis at the time that all this research was being developed and coming out so it's just fun to talk to some of these people who have been there for the, the pioneering of Damn. this industry, so to speak. And um, he still trains like a badass. He still lifts like a badass. And it's just cool to see like, okay, I'm on, I'm on the right road. Like we, we keep doing what we're doing. We can, we can still be badasses our whole life. And you're only as sort of as young or as old well, as you um, really feel or tell yourself. Let's just start off. Tell me a little bit about how you got into training, but so you know, we're going to live it about yourself, Mike. Let the interview okay. play and <laughs> well, hope yeah. you enjoy. So, you know, my dad, he's the one who kind of originally got me into training. You know, he was, um, you know, he was a really ex exceptional high school wrestler. He actually got a, a wrestling scholarship to Arizona, but unfortunately he, he impregnated my mom when she was 15 and he was 16. So change of plans. So he wasn't allowed, he wasn't able to go to, uh, fulfill his dreams of being a college wrestler because so, you fucked it up well no i had an older brother oh that's so right that's right i came five years later so they were a little more responsible at age 21 <laughs> so they had two kids at age 21 so well needless to say um my dad he started coaching at a very young age like 1920 you know since he couldn't compete at the college level so um he started coaching wrestling long before i was even born and uh so he always had this kind of training mindset you know we always conditioned you know, at a very young age, we started lifting weights, you know, and that was kind of the Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, like, building old, era. like Charles Atlas, the old school guys. So we had a little weight set. We'd go work out in the basement, you know, as long, young as like eight or nine. And I enjoyed it. You know, I got to spend time with my dad. You it know, was an iron weeder set. Probably. Yeah. You know, I think it was even some of those ones that were plastic and filled with concrete. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we would lift weights, you know, and then we'd go run together um, you know, wrestling, we were, we wrestled year round. And so I kind of got into this whole training mindset and then, you know, football came around. I was, football was what I was really passionate about. Wrestling was what I was really good at. Okay. Um, wrestling's hard, you know, cutting the weight. I didn't really like doing that too much, but you know, uh, football, my freshman year, 
you know, we actually, my hometown of Kemmer, Wyoming had like one of the, like the longest losing streaks in the entire country. We had lost like 80 games in a row. And so I was coming into this program. It was pretty garbage. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as a freshman, I kind of wanted to, you know, make my presence. And so, you know, there was different kinds of awards you could get. Like if you did so many off season workouts, well, I was the only, only kid in the gym, you know, but there was this, this goal. If you trained so many days, you could get what was called a black shirt. Mm. And so I trained all summer long. I was the only one that was in the weight room. So I was the only one on the team that got this award. It was called the black shirt. Shit, yeah. And so, you know, it kind of, you know, I just noticed is like, if you train hard, things will be given to you. You can progress. Um, you know, I was only one of two freshmen to, to travel on that team. So, you know, I saw, you know, getting success through training. And so needless to say, we started, we finally started to win and we actually got a new football coach and he had some real formal training with weight training. Um, so we got into some Olympic lifting, you know, it was a way more comprehensive program that I would say most, you know, especially in Wyoming where, you know, you don't have a ton of kids. It's not mm -hmm. a high priority that, uh, it was a very comprehensive weight training program. Where'd this coach come from? So he actually, he was an assistant coach at University of Wyoming, but he played at Black Hill State, which is in uh, Spearfish, South Dakota. Okay. And he was a local guy. So they had brought him back and, you know, he was on one of the only teams that had won a state championship in our, for my hometown. So he was kind of a hometown hero type guy, you know, and he pushed us quite a bit, you know, and I was kind of a quiet kid. I didn't really, you know, I wasn't the most popular kid. But, you know, he noticed that I worked hard and I, I was really into the strength training. This is still it's, freshman year? Well, no, this is progressive. Like, like, yeah, later, like junior and senior year. Okay. And so we did, we had great successes in my junior year. And then my senior year, he listed me as a team captain, you know, something I wasn't really expecting. Shit, yeah. So there was, you know, I was kind of surprised at that. So I stepped into a leadership role. And, you know, it was just everything was based around the training. You know, I built myself up. You know, we built the whole team up. And we ended up, we went on to, to win a state championship. That's awesome. So, yeah, it was it was pretty exciting. And that coach went on to do great things. You know, he made it back in the collegiate realm. But I kind of, both he and my dad, you know, kind of instilled that work ethic that, um, you know, I really liked the progress that I saw and the confidence that it gave me. So And you got the itch a little bit because you were lifted and stuff yeah, like that. And, and you so, seeing the progress. And so the next step was, you know, the, the collegiate realm. You know, and I wasn't big enough to do, you know, Division One. I. I told you. You know, I was six foot. You know, I was weighing, you know, in the summer times, that was a hard thing. I would work construction. And so, you know, you're trying to, you know, play football, then cut weight for wrestling. Then in the off season, you're, you're, you know, you're just busting your butt and doing construction. So it was hard to come on a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always floated right around like about 180, 190, but that wasn't big enough, you know, for a, a division one linebacker. So I, I was contacted by the university of Mary and several, several Nebraska schools, um, but I really had a good connection with the University of Mary wrestling coach. And that's what I originally went up there to do, but they were also recruiting me for football. Mm -hmm. So met with the football coaches, went up there. I'm like, yeah, I think I'm gonna give this football thing a try. Uh, so went out for the football team. I ended up not wrestling, um, but then it was a kind of a whole different culture change. You know, it was, it's not high level football. It was uh, NAI. And so you're kind of, you know, they tell you, obviously you got to strength train, but it was nothing really formalized. They tell us, yeah, here's what you should be doing. But then again, it was kind There's of like, no guidance, there really. was no guidance. And yeah. so I was kind of left on my own. I granted, I did have a good, I had a good face for my coach. And um, good discipline. Like it sounded like you exactly. still wanted to do the I still work. Did it, yeah. Did it, yeah. I just didn't yeah. have the direction. And so I did it all on my own, you know, and I had great success. You know, I, you know, um, as far as testing on the team, I was one of the top guys, you know, speed, uh, power you know, strength, but I just didn't have the size, you know, I'm still a little bit smaller of a guy. So I did a lot of, you know, I backed, I was second team linebacker, but I did a lot of special teams, but it, you know, the, kind of the, the whole team atmosphere, what I was used to camaraderie, weight training, uh, it was kind of, wasn't there anymore. And so I, you know, it was paying for my school. What were you, what were you studying? What, were you, uh, what so, program were you doing? So I originally, I, you know, I was wanted to go into pre-physical therapy. I wanted to be a physical therapist. And, um, so there was different routes you could take, you take the biology route or you could take the athletic training route. So I wanted to do more of the, the hands-on athletic, athletic training, athletic training side. So you kind of phased out of football in college and got into just more of just 
caring more about the athletic training of your yeah, I mean, program? I was still I still played football up there all, th- all year. All yeah, four years. so I could I did when I was playing football up there. I couldn't do the athletic training, but that's when I got into the, more of the the wrestling. You okay. know, so I was the athletic training for the, for the wrestling team since that was off season for us. Yeah, and so that was a um, you know their their wrestling program up there was really great. They have a you know Hall of Fame coach. His name was Milo Trusty, and to this day, I've never seen any coach you know push his athletes harder than than what he did. It was almost a little too much, mm. but you know his whole philosophy was. You know, I just want to get kids that are hard workers. You know, I don't care if they were state champs or even took, you know, top three in state. You know, I want to see their work ethic. And then I know if they can work, then I will turn them into the, you know, a national level wrestler. Mm-hmm. And that's like, you know, I I thought that was kind of crazy talk. Who were some of the other big names at that time? Um, like in the training realm. In the training realm, I mean, dude, it was kind of non-existent. Cause I don't know that. I have to look him up. Milo Christie. No, Milo Trust. So he was Milo. a he was a wrestling coach. Okay. Yeah. So he, um, you know, North Dakota has really great wrestling. They have a program called the Mat Pack, and so it has all these different, uh, you know, areas through North Dakota, and it's even gone down into Colorado now. But he was the, the start of that. Okay. You know, like two of the Steiner brothers that wrestled at Iowa, they wrestled underneath him. Another guy named Mike Seeger. He wrestled in Nebraska, but then came back to University of Mary. He was a three-time national champ. So we we had a really good team. You know, they were like runners up, runner up. I don't think they ever uh, won a national championship, but they were always there. Really? Did you? Were there other stuff today in your training that you adopted from observing that guy, Milo Trusty guy? Yeah, you know. Or not really. He pushed. I mean, he almost pushed. I mean, he did this thing. He did some of these workouts called Tired Man, where there was one guy and you had three guys rotating on you. And it was, he would have the heavyweights guard the door and they would just rotate on one guy to where guys would break down and cry and try to escape. And he would have the heavyweight, you know, throw him back in the ring. Full of these grown grown ass men would, would cry. And it was just, they would only do it a couple times a year. But then he would always say, like, oh, it's, you know, you're training out, you're getting outside of your own body. It's like being born. He would always say it's like being born again. But it, to me, it, like watching from an outside and like knowing training principles, it was a whole different level of exertion and almost like punishment. Yeah. So. But it sounds like they're, they're like trying to we- get the weakness out of it. Oh, individual. well, it did. I mean, these these dudes were tough. And I mean, they idolized this guy. And he's yeah. he's a very successful coach. I mean, on his They probably off- went off to be great wrestlers yeah, at well, least. In this guy's off season, he would go help Dan Gable run wrestling camps. So, I mean, he's one of the greatest coaches of all time. Yeah. So, these two guys working hand in hand together, they knew what they were doing. They knew how to get, you know, every, motivated yeah, every, every ounce of effort out of every one of the wrestlers. That's brutal. But yeah, it's it was it was cool, man. You know, yeah. it was a good experience. You know, we had uh, we had a lot of good wrestlers on the team. Unfortunately, when you train that hard, there's going to be a lot of injuries at the same time. So we did come across quite a bit of injuries. Um, but you were more the athletic. I was more the athletic training side, so yeah. not the physical therapy. You know, I did an internship with physical therapy. Same. And uh, you know, I went to the hospital and I observed. I helped out. And I would even talk to some of the physical therapists. I'm like, do you enjoy what you're, what you're doing? And I never really, none Got of them. Got the impression that they did. No, they really didn't. And I was kind of like, man, maybe I, this isn't something I really wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so I kind of dropped my whole idea of going into physical therapy and I wanted to go more on the strength conditioning side. That's really funny because honestly, I did a, like a couple of parallels. Like I, I was a captain my senior year, a soccer team that was losing all my middle school and high school years. And then we had the first winning record my senior year. We went on to the state tournament, which we had never been to as a school. And then, uh, oh, what was the last one he just said? He just said something that reminded me of physical therapy. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I did an internship yeah. in physical therapy. And I was just so turned off by it because, um, like, a lot of people that were just continue to come to physical therapy that didn't need it. And a lot of people that were just using like their insurance program just to get someone to like, hang out with someone basically and yeah. like, didn't see like any progression really. So I was like, you know what, let's try to make people stronger and be proactive about the injury. Ahead yeah, of time. exactly. So yeah. when'd you get your first training job after college? Um, so 
so I did that. I did my undergrad there. I finished an athletic training and I mean, I graduated in four years. So I was kind of like, well, you know, athletic training at the same time, it's like, you look at the pace, the, the pay scale on that. Like, so if you think about a team, who's got to be there the first, you know, coaches, but athletic trainers have to be there at the very beginning. Who's got to be there at the very end athletic trainers. So you're putting in a ton of time and not really getting compensated that well. Yeah. And it's like, I'm like, I kind of looked at the pay scale. I'm like, I need to do something a little bit more than that. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, possibly a collegiate strength coach. So I knew I'd have to get my master's for that. So I applied to, you know, University of Utah, Utah State, University of Wyoming. Was, that's where I'm from. And um, I got into all three schools, but it was University of Wyoming. If you went to graduate school there, you had to have an assistantship. So you actually got paid to go to college. So I'm like, oh, shit. you know, I would get in-state tuition. That's awesome. uh, so it kind of made sense to go to Wyoming. So, you know, and what that assistantship included was, you know, I had to teach some anatomy and physiology labs, exercise physiology labs um, for, you know, I did some aquatic rehabilitation for some of the wrestlers. So I had put that on my application. So they made me teach a swimming program, which I How was that it was horrible. <laughs> I, mean, I pretty much I went in there the first day of class and there was like 30, 40 students. I'm like, how many how many of you have a good swimming background? And every one of them raised their hands. And I'm like, well, I have no swimming background. <laughs> and for and so they made me teach this class, but I kind of did a little flip. I'm like, well, as your assignment, each one of you are going to have to teach one of the classes and I'll, I'll supervise. Nice. Each. And nice. so I kind of copped out, but needless to say, that was the only time I ever taught that swimming class, you know, circuit training class. Um, intro to strength training, you know, all these college level classes that a lot of the incoming freshmen and sophomores take. That's what I was, I was doing that. Yeah. So, and I did have a part with the, the university of Wyoming strength conditioning as well. Um, you know, my second year as a student there at the university of Wyoming, uh, I was hoping that that would go somewhere with that program, but unfortunately it just didn't work out. So. But I, I feel like you're, you're really good in the strength conditioning realm. Like, the way you talk about programming and stuff like that, like you're really good at making people stronger, getting people leaner, getting people better conditioned. So like, didn't you, you didn't go and get your CSCS? Well, no, I, I, got, I got my CSCS while I was going to graduate school okay. at University of Wyoming. Okay. So I got that and, um, you know, I was hoping to, you know, continue on with the University of Wyoming, but it's, you know, and I'm sure you've heard it before, like, if you talk a lot of guys in the industry, it's kind of a good old boy network. It's like who you know, right? Who you can you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you have a lot of these, you know, upcoming students that have been, you know, just pounding the, you know, learning the science, the background, everything else. But still, you know, I was I was still training very hard myself. So it's like I wasn't just, you know, a little nerd. I was actually applying it to myself. Right. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, in that industry, it's, you know, when a new coach comes in, usually they wipe the slate clean. You know, very rarely does the strength coach use you know, the same exactly or stay, stay when the coaching program comes in. Everybody's right? got their guy, and you know, when you're an assistant or you're just getting your feet wet, you're not making a lot of money, and there can be you know system changes really quick. So. Well, even when we were talking, it was like the strength conditioning coaches at the Utah Jazz probably only making like 30, 40 a year. You know, yeah. so it's like a really hot, steep curve because then you read articles about like Scott Cochran. Who out of Alabama? He's making like, like two hundred fifty thousand a year or something like that. Oh, yeah. Well, I think he ended up going to. He ended up taking a position. He wanted to be more on the coaching side, so he went and actually got an assistant coaching job at Georgia. But he was making quite a bit more than that. Like I think the highest paid guy is um, I can't remember his name, but he's at the University of Iowa. You okay. Know, he was one. He was a guy that studied under Mike Boyle. Okay. A lot he was, of, he was the highest paid. He's the highest condition paid, coach. Yeah. You know, I or it's Alabama. A, but it's a steep, you know. I mean, it's a steep climb to get there. Like before, you're you're probably between ten and fifty thousand at most yeah, for a exactly. long time until you get to the the big shot. Yeah, you know, programs. some of the guys like even here, you know, Pac-12 coaches. I think they're making between three and five hundred thousand. You know, so they're they're getting a pretty good salary right now. But yeah. to get to that position, the coaches though, you're saying, or the strength, strength the head strength and condition, three hundred fifty, you think, three hundred, three hundred, five hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think. Uh, I think his dad named Doug Eliasa. I think he's close to, because I mean, they're state employees. You can look it up. Hmm. And then, you know, granted, there's a bunch of incentives based upon how far they go in, in their season. You know, if there's a bonus structure, but they can make up three, three fifty, five hundred. But that's like, 
you know, I'd say probably only five top five percent of the strength coaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or in exactly. that realm. Right. So So when um so fast forward to when you uh went on to go to like the Paul Check Institute and stuff like that. Well how long was the period between your first job teaching that swimming course till like getting to Paul Check Institute, meeting Mike Boyle, meeting Greg Cook? Well yeah, you know, it's so yeah, I'll back up a little bit. You know, when I finished at University of Wyoming, I, I knew I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to make this happen, it's going to have to be in the personal training realm. So it was kind of a, you know, obviously in Wyoming, you have to be in a city or more like mm-hmm. urban area. So I was thinking Not either. many of those in Wyoming? No, I mean, their idea of exercise is bucking hay bales, you know. <laughs> yeah. Wrestling cattle. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so I kind of flipped a coin between Denver and Salt Lake, and I chose Salt Lake. Uh, you know, I was a little more familiar with this area. I had some buddies that lived in this area. Uh, so, you know, applied at 24 hour, came down, you know, they make you take a little test, I passed the test, whatever, met with the general manager and uh, didn't get a good vibe with him. I'm like, yeah, I don't think this is an organization that I really want to be involved with. Because um, they wanted you to sell supplements or something, right? No, or you what, know, what was it? They wanted you to sell something weird, right? No, so it wasn't that. It was, you know, I had... So the deal was I had finished all my coursework at the University of Wyoming, but I still had to finish my, my graduate paper, um, which I did on Androstein Dion. I don't know if you remember, you know, that whole Sammy Sosa, okay. um, uh, Mark McGuire thing when they were going back and forth with the home run, you know, that, that was one of the supplements they said they were on. It was a precursor to testosterone. So there wasn't a whole lot of research on it. And you did a whole research paper. I did it. Is yeah. it online? Could I find it somewhere? I don't know if you can find it. I still have a, a copy of it. I still have it on a floppy disk. Where I don't, <laughs> even, <laughs> I don't even know how you access those anymore. I know, but it was, uh, you know, it was, I was very interested in supplementation at the time. And, uh, you know, there was hardly any research out on it. So I'm like, well, if there's hardly any research out on it, it's going to be really easy to do a liter- literature, literature review on it. What was, what was it called they did it on? Androstein dione supplementation. So it's the direct precursor to testosterone. Did you mean Michael Rose is the American singer, songwriter, and guitarist, best known for his involvement in the band Smile? That's, that's what I do on my side, <laughs> my side gig. <laughs> no, you're not going to be able to find it. Dude, this is like 1998. Okay. You know, kind of the internet. Was Before cool. internet, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty funny, though. I'll, I'll have to do some research and try to find it. But it was, you know, so what had happened was, so I had, I had finished my coursework. I had already had my bachelor's. And in, in order to have the NSCA, CSCS, you have to have a four-year degree. Mm. So I, I had my CSCS. I went and sat with this uh, 24-hour manager. And he's like, okay, so you have your, your athletic training degree. You have your CSCS but you don't have your master's quite yet. I'm like, yeah, cause I'm just, I'm finishing out my paper. I'm going to finish while I'm down here in Utah. And he's like, you know, I've never heard of athletic training. And I'm like, yeah, dude, it's a, it's a four year degree. It's allied health field. Like it's a pretty well recognized uh, degree. And he's like, yeah, man, I'm going to, if I'm going to give you a job here at 24 hour, then I'm going to need to see your, your sealed transcript. That's such, so funny. Cause so, that place, I feel like nowadays anyone could walk in and get a, get a job off the street. Yeah, so it was, that was kind of put a bad taste in my mouth. And I'm glad that, that it did, you know, then I, I'm just like driving around. I'm like, well, what else? There, I'm like, oh, there's a Pally's gym. I'll go check that out. So I walked in and I'm like, where's your training manager? And he came up and I'm like, yeah, I want, to, I want to be a trainer here. And he looked at my credentials. He's like, you got your master's? Well, I'm like, not quite yet. He's like, well, there's a new gym just opening up called Excel. He's like, if I was going to train, I would go train there. So then I jumped back in my car and I came here. And they had just hired a bunch of new trainers. It was kind of the new hot gym. So actually Emmett told me, he's like, yeah, I'd come back in a couple months and we'll see if we can give you a job. I got to get these other guys busy at first. So I built up a little bit of clientele that, at Bally's and I pulled them over here, which ethically probably wasn't the best thing to do, but I was still kind of a young punk. Still um, are a punk. Yeah, I still am kind of, I'm an old punk now. <laughs> so I brought my clients over here, um, you know, and it was kind of a different you know, you, you're into the strength conditioning realm. That Bally's isn't still there. No, it? it's not there yeah. anymore. I think Bally's as a whole shut down quite a while ago. Bankrupt. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you have all this background in strength conditioning. Granted, I did have the athletic training, which really helped quite a bit, you know, but you still didn't, 
like as far as like knee replacements, hip replacements, things that like older older adults start to get. You really didn't, you weren't that well educated on that. Right. So, you know, here I can't, I start, started excelling. Like I'm gonna be training all these high level athletes. You know, I'm gonna get all these high school kids. And then, you know, you, they put a 60 year old woman who has a hip replacement in front of you. You're like, well, this is gonna be your client. I'm like, all right. So it was definitely a learning curve. Like, okay, well, how do I take everything I've known about human performance and do apply it to this 60 year old lady. So it was definitely a, a change of, of the way that I was used to doing things. So. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. It, was, it, was, you, you, it, was, it sound it sounded like you were geared and headed in a direction for like, shit. I don't know. Even working with like, the military and training the military at Hill yeah, Air you know, Force Base or something. Yeah, and my science background I felt was really, really right. good. Exos. You ever heard of Exos yeah. performance? Like, it seemed like you were about to head in that direction. Well, that's the funny thing you say about Exos is, you know, there was a guy um, that he, we both started the graduate school at University of Wyoming at the same time. And I'm trying to, God, his name, now that you say this, his name's slipping my mind. But he ended up, he's like, yeah, he was from Arizona State. He's like, this guy that I know is getting ready to start this program down, in, you know, right outside of Arizona State. And he goes, I think it sounds like a really good idea. I'm like, yeah, you're just going to drop your, you know, you're going to drop out of grad school to go do this. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a gamble on it. But it ended up turning out to be at athlete's performance, you know, Mark for okay. Yeah. So yeah. this, this guy. Um, so they, they bought athletic performance. Yeah. Exo, athletic, yeah. Athletic Exos performance bought. is now Exos. Right, right, right. But so this guy actually made it up to be the head strength conditioning coach at athletes performance, you know, for Stegen was the owner, but he was the top. And so, and after he broke off from that, you know, he did some other stints, like he was Brock Lesnar's personal strength conditioning coach. He was the strength conditioning coach for the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. And then after that, he was the strength conditioning coach for the uh, Denver Broncos. Now he's at Houston. So I think it was a pretty good move for him to do what he did. And it sounded like you went, you were like Luke Richardson was his name. Leaded towards athletics and then just went towards general pop. Which, yeah, I mean it, it is more lucrative, honestly, and I feel like it's more, uh, it's more meaningful. You know, you're, you're sitting there trying to help somebody get off their blood pressure medication. Yeah, or they might have diabetes and heart you know, risk for heart disease, and you're helping them stay healthy and fit and keep their life together. No, it is. It does feel a lot more rewarding than just working with like an athlete and just trying to make their them like a tenth of a second faster oh, or something yeah. like that. But, yeah, and that yeah, and that's a crazy thing, you know. In this industry, it's like you find, you know, you develop these relationships with a lot of your people and your clients, and they almost because they do become your family. And you and I think about you know I've been doing this for twenty years you know, train some people five days a week, train some people three days a week. I start adding up all the time. I'm like, man, I've, I've actually spent more time with a lot of these people than my own family. Yeah. And they probably know me better than my own family. Yeah. So it's kind of a, it's no, a crazy thing. It, it stuck out when, um, you know, I talked to a lot of people. I'm a very talkative person. I've met a lot of different trainers. A lot of people have been in this industry for 20, 30 years. And no one's ever told me a story about how when their client died, that they were left in their will. Like you, you were given a, a chunk of change from a client who died. Yeah, it's it, kind of a crazy thing. Yeah, I mean that just shows like how impactful you get into someone's life. Yeah, it's pretty badass. Yeah, I, you know that was a, a weird thing. I, you know, this guy was a, he was a big deal in my life. You know, I trained him five days a week for fifteen years. You know, and then he he came down with a a really rare form of lymphoma cancer, and it took him away pretty quick. Um. But yeah, I mean, he's, I still think about him every day. He's a, he was a really good client, and I was just fortunate enough that he thought enough about me that he did. He left me in his will, and I, I, that's something I really I don't really tell too many people about. Yeah, you know, I don't. I haven't told my parents about that. No, it's not like thing. Yeah, it's really, not nothing. You don't brag, brag to me. About you don't brag it. No, about it, but no, it's no. like it just goes. You just you make a lasting impact in a lot of people's lives, and you don't you don't really realize how important you are. Until unfortunately that there that person is gone. You yeah, know? No, I I see it on both ends because like not only do like the trainer not realize how um, impactful they can be to the client, but the client can also not realize how impactful the trainer's been in their life. But you know, I mean, we wear so many different hats between being like a person's 
therapist, you know, and, the, and not, not to mention all the topics we talk about in training, which is like nutrition, sleep, stress, you know, yeah. all that stuff. And it's just, uh, it goes a long way because it, it, it takes more than just someone to write the program and count the reps. You no. know what I mean? Yeah. You gotta, you gotta be engaged. You gotta, you know, you gotta have a, a, a you know, an active personality. This person's looking forward to coming and seeing, you know, they just, some people do just want the training, but some people do want, you know, they want to know what makes Matt Gluckman tick. They want to know what you're up to. You know, that's, there's a whole different, there's a lot of different, just like you said, there's a lot of different hats that you have to wear. Yeah. So then, okay. So when, uh, you got to Excel, you started building your business here. You probably, it's, it sounds like that was probably a time when you started to get more business minded. Cause I feel like when you go to the athletic training route, it, everything's kind of handled for you a little bit more Yeah. versus when you came here, right. You had to learn how to like manage your own business, manage your own schedule, become an entrepreneur essentially. Yeah, no. And then when did you start to do things like go for like the Paul check Institute or, you know, it was, we all, you know, that was a good thing that I came in at a good time. Like everybody was kind of a brand new trainer at this facility. Um, we we're all super driven, you know, as far as a group of trainers, we're all very educated. And, you know, some of the other places I'd looked at, you know, it was just like, Oh, he just has a personal training certificate, you know, didn't have a bachelor's, didn't have a master's. And I'm not saying that you need those degrees to be a, a really good trainer because one of the best trainers on our staff is, you know, Janelle and she's, she's all self-taught. She doesn't have any college education, but she, her programming is probably, you know, some of the best programming that I've ever seen. Nice. So I'm not saying you need to be educated, but it really, no. it kind of, you know, since I had put in the time, it really kind of drew me to this place, you know, Emmett had his masters. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, this is a good place to be. And so we started, you know, and it was kind of a weird time, a transition time where, you know, it wasn't just about the bodybuilding anymore. It was like, Hey, you know, there's a sick, um, you know, some people with some injuries type population. And that's when the whole NASM started to come in, you know, the National Academy of Sports Medicine. So it really kind of felt like this was a, you know, a, tr a, a combination of both strength and conditioning, but also physical therapy, you know, that a, a personal trainer could, you know, do both within one. So we were all kind of started studying under this NASM. Hmm. But then the more I looked into it, it's like, well, where's NASM getting all this information? And then you start digging a little bit deeper then you find somebody who's a little bit, you know, ahead of the curve, which was, at the time was Paul check, you know, a lot of his strength conditioning was he still is kind of ahead of the curve. No, I'm he not is sure for a good reason or bad reason. No, now, but no, he's great. And I mean, he's, no, I'm just teasing. He's one of the, the smartest individuals in this, in this realm. And if you ever had the chance to listen to him talk, I mean, he can quote sources and talk about anything, you know, and he just remembers it. He can just fire it off. Yeah. And so he was really a pretty impressive guy. I really liked his attitude. You know, he was kind of a almost first Paul check. He was more of a militant, you know, training Navy SEALs, hard ass, kick your ass type guy. And now he's in his rock garden. Stacking yeah, rocks. now he's in. Yeah, he's stacking rocks and playing with crystals and you know chakras and this and that. And you know, I'm nothing against him. That no, that's what I mean. Like he's ahead of the curve. Yeah, yeah. and mate, it's just me. My my whole mindset, I wasn't ready to, to go that far into it. So, you know, a big group of us here started studying under the, uh, under the Czech Institute, you know, there was different levels. You had to get your checks at a Czech exercise coach. And there was level one, level two, went all the way to level four. What did it, what was the stipulation to be level one? You had to do your Czech exercise coach. Yeah, what was that? What was the stipulation? So there's, you know, there was a bunch of, um, you know, you had to take some tests. You had to complete some online coursework. Uh, this is back in the day when there wasn't even really DVDs, dude. We were popping in VHSs and watching Paul Check videos. Uh, but a big group of us here were, were we were totally into it. Yeah. And uh, so I finished Check Level Two, and then you know there were some transitions in my life. I uh, actually ended up moving to Arizona to take a training job down there. And that's kind of when I put my whole check thing on hold. And um, you want me to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, okay. for sure. So what were you doing in Arizona? Did I not tell you about this? I don't think so. Okay, so what, you know, I had a buddy who was in the in the equipment arena. He was a sales rep for Free Motion. And I said, you know, if you're ever, he was covering the four states area, you know, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. I said, if you ever see a good opportunity, uh, let me know about it. It's because I'm. 
feel like I've kind of grown to my max here at Excel and I want to try to do something different. And so there was a performance gym that was being set up down there uh, in Arizona by the guy. He's, he, oh, he, has, he goes by two last names, Dean Kamanzas and Dean Cummings. So Mike Clark and Dean Cummings were the two that started NASM. So I thought, hey, you know what, this would be cool. You know, go work under the guy that, you know, started NASM. I think that'd be a really good thing in a bigger market, you know, Scottsdale. You know, a lot more athletes, a bigger population. I just wanted to see what we could do down there. And so I interviewed for that position for two years. I ended up getting it. And then I, I moved down there, you know, got all the programming set up and everything. And uh, it was in 2007, you know, which kind of... The economy was economy took, or something. You know, it, took, to it, took a, it took a shit. Yeah. And, you know, it took, it, it, it took a shit first in, you know, Phoenix and in, you know, Vegas. And so a lot of our our investors were uh, construction guys and that industry just got really killed, got their ass kicked. So needless to say, our, all our uh, private investors pulled the plug on the project. But in the meantime, you know, I had been working down there for six months. I've been training some guys on the side uh, in our facility, you know, developed some good relationships, you know, Goran Dragic was playing for the Phoenix Sun at the time. And then I also got to work with Claude Lemieux. You know, he was a retired NHL player and, uh, he was 42 years old and he wanted to make an NHL comeback. And so he had never lifted weights before. And he's just this beast of a dude. I mean, he's listed as one of the dirtiest players ever in professional hockey. I mean, he's just the most, one of the most intimidating guys I've ever met. Do you have a signed Jersey? Yeah, yeah, I have, I do have a signed Jersey from him. So he's one of the only players to win three national or three Stanley cups on three different teams. So he's a real deal. Yeah. Uh, so I worked with him, you know, pretty much the entire time that I was down there. What was his programming like? Well, you said he never he lifted never weights. Did weights. Yeah. So you just started off with like high, high reps. High, yeah. High, uh, dude, he was a professional athlete, so he was super. He was super functional, super explosive. Didn't really have any any serious injuries. He had never squatted before. He hadn't done anything with a kettlebell. Like his strength condition, strength conditioning. I don't even know in the NHL if it's still really relevant. But when I was training him at that time, he said, yeah, we had some assistant coach tell us what to do. And I said, he, he would say, I'm not doing that. I go, and I'm, I even asked him, I'm like, have you ever taken any, you know, performance enhancing drugs? And he says, yeah, vodka and Marlboro lights. <laughs> so those guys are, you know, those hockey players are kind of barbarians. So we trained him. We got him, we got him to lose 20 pounds of body fat. And he actually made it back into the NHL. Yeah, it was pretty yeah. badass. He made it. He got on. The, he ended up getting on with the San Jose. Well, so Sharks. tell me a little bit about what you did with him. What, what you did with him, like the first week you saw him. It's like prep him up for the weights that were to come. Because you eventually worked with him on like explosive, oh, like yeah. two rep, three reps things. Well, well that's what I do. Pretty much everything right out of the gate. You showed him how to do anything. He could do it. Yeah. Like front squat, back squat. He did have some wrist and elbow issues, so he had a hard time with front squat. But I mean. He was he had good squat and everything was was good right out of the gates. The dude, I mean, he rode his bike. He was so did you have him do like like total body five days a week? Or do like we were training, days a... No, we were training five days a week. Yeah, you know, we would split it up. You know, squat pattern one day, deadlift pattern another day. You know, Olympic lifting. You know, at that stage of the game, early forties, we didn't really really even get into that. So we did a lot of single arm stuff like dumbbell snatches, kettlebell stuff you know, to get his power up, but he, his power was already pretty much there. Yeah. But yeah, gifted, he, just kind of he was gifted. Yeah. Bit, his, yeah. His brother was an NHL player as well. Um, but yeah, he was a, he was a pretty fun guy to work with. And then did you do like, like any type of specific periodization with him or anything? Well, yeah. I mean, I, that's the thing with me is I've always, you know, I've tried all the different periodizations my favorite that I've had the best results is just the linear periodization, you know, um, you know, basing, you know, modifying it based on how much time I'm going to have with the individual, you know, six months with him. I didn't know how long it was going to last, you know, so obviously you start with higher volume stuff, learning the movement patterns, you know, then you get more strength stuff then you get some strength power and then you kind of just keep circuiting through that. Um, cause he was still a ways out before he was going to try out for the, so you're just basically like adjusting percentages of the yeah. weight based on the rep count. Like one yeah. week maybe do sets of five, next week sets of three. Yeah, and exactly. Kind of cycle it back and down to like deload week and then back up again. Yeah, and that's kind of what I do with you know even my even myself and the guys that I train here. You know, I kind of people are like, well, how do you keep track of everybody's periodization? It's like, well, whatever kind of 
period is periodization I'm on, if it's applicable to the client, I kind of have them doing the same thing yeah. just so everybody's kind of on the same page. Yeah. But in this industry, it's like, you know, it's like you, if you have a program written up and then your client comes in and they say, Oh, I didn't sleep last night. My kids yeah. kept me up. You know, I'm feeling sick. We're like, okay, well, I guess this, this ball buster workout I was going to do with you isn't going to work. Right. Yeah. And, you know, check was one of the first ones to really, you know, with a physiological load, like the stressors on a people's body. He was one of the first guys to really be talking about that. You know, your physical stress, your mental stress, emotional stress, yeah. spiritual stress true. and where you're at, where your buckets are. And if your buckets are high, you know, it's, you know, it's not a good idea. Like people would always say, oh, I need to, I need to kick the shit out of me. I had a rough night or I drank too much last night. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what you need to do with that person. Yeah. And so right. it was kind of, you know, back 20 years ago, that was a pretty big mind shift. Right. Because like, they were just like, load them up. Just yeah. Keep throwing weight on the them. shit out of them. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's not what you need to do. And it, it takes some education, like with your clients to say, like, no, with all the stress in your life, we need to do something a little bit different. So Arizona working with athletes, um, at like the elite level. Yeah. And then the economy tanks and you came back to Salt Lake, came back to Excel. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I had been gone six months. I owned a house up here and I, you know, I, I know I could have kept, I could have made it happen down there, but you know, the economy was just crumbling. You had this house. You yeah. Bought this house. I had bought that house. Oh, shit. Nice. And so it was, it was horrible timing. Like just a lot of bad things happened that same year. My mom passed away this long-term girlfriend. We split up. In Arizona, I moved down there and that thing shut down. And, you know, I had that house and I had actually built another spec house and I had just sold that spec house, which I would have, me personally, I would have liked to have lived in. Mm. But the very next day, they're like, yeah, we're shutting our doors. I'm like, well, great. I just sold this badass house. And then with the economy going nosedive, and I'm like, I had to get rid of it. So yeah. I, I sold it for a good price. So, then I moved back and I had just put a renter in my, my current house. You had to go find a place to rent. I had to go find another place. So it was just, it was bad timing. I got my ass kicked, you know, and I had lined up all my clients with other trainers. And, and so some of them did come back to me, but it was like, you know what? I just had to start, start Come's fresh. fresh yeah. And so I had to build up a whole new clientele in the, the downturn economy, you know? So I had to get a little bit creative, you know, Alan Cosgrove, you know, he was kind of the, the first foremost, you know, small, small group training. So I, I bought one of his DVDs and I started applying some of his principles. Like, so it could be more affordable for people to train with me. So I was one of the first trainers at this facility to kind of do that whole group group training, training, small group like training thing. So it's, it made it happen, you know, and, um, otherwise I, I probably would have had to get out of this industry. Yeah. So it's funny how the dollar sign plays a big role into people's motivation, whether the lack thereof or get, gets them going, showing up. Cause like, you know, I mean, it's the major reason why like Planet Fitness operates so well, cause they operate off like the 30% model, like only 30% of their members are ever going to show up. And I remember reading a statistic that was like something like 70% of the people who sign up in January 1st or January, they don't even show up to the gym the rest of the month, yeah. you know, and they want that. But it's like, if you spend, if you're just going to invest, like if you're going to dip your toe in like a dollar a month to go to a gym, you're never going to go. No. And it's the same kind of thing with training. Like if you have a gym membership and, and it's free to go, who's holding you, who's holding a gun to your head to go. But when you have, buy a trainer and invest in yourself a little bit, it really yeah. is. It's money. You're investing in yourself and it holds you accountable. But, then that next piece being able to just be like, okay, well, let's find the sweet spot for, you know, you can't afford this private one-on-one hands-on attention, but you still need someone there. Well, here you go. You can pay a little bit less, but you're with the group. So you get less one-on-one time, but you still get the, the benefit of that yeah. personalized yeah. coaching. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was a good thing. And it was kind of a transition in my career because, you know, a lot of the times, you know, the one-on-one, like you know, it doesn't always go the way you want. You want to, you want to be first and foremost, a trainer. Like, let me apply my skills to you and get and you. And then we can talk about whatever. We can talk about, about what your, your little shit son said to you or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, but you, that's part of the game, man. You got to be somewhat of a little bit of a counselor at the same time. So what I found was, you know, when it's I said. to be able to adapt. Like yeah. A hundred percent on the fly, no matter what's happening. Yeah. So I started putting, you know, I started putting together some of these small groups. You know, especially with the women, you know, I mean, 
I'm not being sexist, but women like to talk. Yeah. And so when it's just me and one of them, they they like to talk. So when I started getting my groups of women, then I noticed they, you know, they start talking with each other. You know, then I can kind of control Free the group. Your mind set a little yeah, bit to so focus I could, on what you want to do. Yeah, I could be training the women, you know, and they could kind of chit chat with each other, but I could be watching them, you know, their movement patterns, correcting them, you know, motivating them, and I didn't have to be part of the conversation anymore. Right. And that's it's that, nice. you know, if doing tw- you know, 10, 12 hours a day of that, uh, where it's one on one and you're just kind of, kind of getting verbally assaulted, not assaulted, just a lot of verbal, you know, interaction totally. it's exhausting you get distracted too and it is it is mentally exhausting trying to keep up with whatever else is going on in their life and you're, you're already trying to make sure everything's good with like form and the weight and you know they're breathing and you know setting up and breaking down and you know setting up for the next thing and is equipment going to be open and then they ask you like five questions that don't pertain to anything about training and you're like uh how do i nicely not answer these questions and get them to do the next thing. Yeah. It's definitely a, a struggle and definitely something that they didn't teach us in, in school for. No, but it's, yeah, you know, I've had, you know, I've worked construction, you know, 12 hours a day construction. So it's physically demanding, you know, but when you're having it, like you have to be on it you, when you're working with your client, you have to be mentally engaged. You can't ask them two times in one hour. Like, what'd you do last night? Cause if you do, they're like, I already told you, you son of a bitch. Aren't you <laughs> listening to what I'm having to say? Right. So, I mean, you gotta be, you have got to be on your toes. You gotta be engaged. Yeah. And that's why like, uh, honestly, like, I had a bad experience because I, I, I must've had a bad experience. I feel because I got into group training. That was the first thing I did in my first gym. And it was all trainers that like literally weren't even trainers. They were athletes. I wasn't even a trainer yet. I was working the front desk. And then I just got my cert through the ACE and, and a couple of the other guys just got one online and found like a place that they could do it for like 50 bucks. They, they took a test and were, had their cert right yeah. there because there's no certifying company that checks these yeah. certification companies. So I got, I was, I started a group training and I hated it. I yeah. hated it. And just cause I, I needed that more of that one-on-one dynamic and, most of the time, I still can just get people to talk about the training, even if we're really yeah. fine into details about it. But yeah, I really don't like going off topic because it's just not my bread and butter. I don't want to yeah. waste my time or the client's time, yeah. you know, but it's rude if you're like not going to address something. No, and I do. You know, I have my, still have my one-on-ones and I would say one-on-one makes, makes up a majority of my business, but the, the groups, you know, at peak times, you know, we can kind of group people together. That's it's kind of nice. It gives you a lot of bang for your buck. And you're helping more people. Honestly, yeah. like I, I also got to credit you that, uh, you have the endurance. Like I remember getting in this field and reading a lot of the strength and conditioning coaches and they were like, you should be, you should be doing no more than like five sessions a day Oh yeah. because of the amount of time that you need after each session to break down and look at their program, look at the notes you made for that program for that hour. That's going to make them better for tomorrow's extra or program oh, yeah. or the next day, whatever. Um, and shit, man, like just for our listeners, I, I just want to run through what your schedule looks like. I mean, you're usually here about 6 a.m. to about 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. You train a little bit. You, you, you used to do some groups on Saturdays, but between those hours, because you're doing group training, you're probably at least seeing, I would think, between group training and individuals, what, like, 60 different people a yeah, week? Probably. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm probably right about, I've bounced between 40 and 50 paid appointments a week right now. But in the, when I was really grinding, when I was in you know, my late 20s, early 30s, and I, it's kind of embarrassing to say, because I've, I've even been scolded by like Paul Check and his people. And they're, you know, they're like talking, they just talk about the same thing. Like you should only be doing five appointments a day. You know, no more than that. They're talking about burnout. Burnout, right. yeah. yeah. And yeah. they're like, you know, some of my, my co-workers here would be like, oh, Rosas is training 12 to 16 appointments a day. And, you know, they come down on you. How do you think you can do that? You know, and that's a big thing. Like you, you do that much. Yeah. Quality sometimes is going to drop a little bit, but you just got to re-motivate yourself. Like yeah, I, I, I get excited, you know, every morning and I tell my wife this, you know, when you have a big day schedule, it's like your new competition. You know, I don't, I don't have the wrestling anymore. I don't have the football anymore, but I just look at that day and I'm like, all these appointments back to back. You live for the channel. Yeah, dude. And you like, when you can look, sit back at the end of the day and assess how you did, and, you know, and I'll be honest with myself. I'm like, I did a half ass day, 
you know, but that me being honest with myself will allow me to do a better job the next day. 100%. And so we all kind of, you know, I've seen a lot of, you know, at this gym, you know, we have, you know, five to 10 trainers that have been training for 20, all close to 20 years. They're like you go to any gym, I guarantee you're probably not going to find too many gyms where they have 10 trainers that have been doing it for 20 years. It just doesn't happen like that. No, you go to. The trainer room is just insane. Yeah. If you're like, who's your most tenured trainer? Oh, he's been here two years. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, well, you know, we have 10 people who have been here for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So the reason behind that is we have good clients. Uh, the gym has always treated us well. And it's a good environment. You know, yeah. we're kind of the focal point of the of the gym. So it's a good place to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If our clients weren't treating us well, Jim wasn't treating us well, we, we wouldn't have as many veterans as we do here. And then well, as manager, you know, like with you being a kind of a, one of our newer guys on the staff, but you've been here, what, three, four years already? Three years. Three yeah. years. Yeah. You know, I was a little hesitant. You know, I had some of the older guys that had kind of dipped down a little bit. And I was like, well, I got to get some of my veterans a little bit busier before I bring on anything new. But, you know, our numbers, we never really, we weren't really growing. If anything, we were kind of going down just a little bit. So I was like, you know what, something's got to change. We need some new blood. And you were one of the first ones that we really, newbies that we brought on in a long time. And, you know, there was a, it took a little while for, for you to get going. But once you did, it was like, hey, you know, he's already turning into one of our top producers now. You know, maybe this isn't a bad idea, you know, getting some new blood in this, in this facility. And that kind of steamrolled, you know, I kind of saw, nice. like, okay, you know, both Nate and I saw like Matt's kick, kicking ass. You know, and Tyler came up. I'm like, well, we don't really need Tyler, but you know, he had a really good background. He trained with oh, Todd Durbin. Look, look at how yeah. great it is to the facility. Now. And so, yeah, so it's kind of you know, a lot of the the new guys have really made their the old guys kind of step it up a little bit, myself included. You know, then we saw some of our good females. You know, Caitlin, Elise, they've come in. You know, it. yeah, they've done really well. So. The, the young blood is definitely, I would say, outperforming the old blood right now. So, and that's a good mix. You know, it kind of makes us stay on our toes. Yeah, well, it would need about two young bloods to outperform one old blood. If we're <laughs> talking about you right oh. now. But honestly, like this was this was awesome. I just uh, we might have to do it again because I wanted to hear more about like the story with Greg Cook, the story with Mike Boyle oh, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we can we'll, talk about that at a later date. But, yeah, we can do it another time. But yeah, we can, yeah, I mean, we can also talk about more of the, the science and my philosophies, but yeah. that's just kind of who I am. And, and that's exactly where I wanted to begin. I just wanted to uh, to end with a couple of basic questions. Like, you know, what's your favorite lift, your favorite exercise? You know, I like squat. You know, yeah, just a typical yeah, back like, squat. I like a back squat. I do a low bar back squat, which you don't like, but I've always because you, you, you do like a low bar. Oh, um, come on. Good morning. Come on. <laughs> just kidding, you asshole. <laughs> uh, but you—that's very old school of thinking. Like, oh, I like the back squat. Like, yeah. I'm surprised you didn't say concentration curls or something. Well, you know what? I, well, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. But you know, it's like you know when I was in the strength and conditioning for the wrestling world. The only thing that those guys were on was the airdyne, you know, mm. and that was over 20 yeah. years ago. And that's yeah. all we, if you were, if you couldn't wrestle, then you're on the airdyne. And these guys, these wrestlers are like, well, fuck that. I'd rather wrestle hurt than be on that goddamn airdyne. And that's, I, I would do a lot of interval type programs, you know, zone one, zone two programs for these wrestlers. But, uh, you know, a lot of these old school strength conditioning tools have, have come back into, into our our lives 100 yeah, percent. yeah you know like into the training today yeah and even yeah. if you read it like some of the old school paul check like early 2000 late night like even late 90s he said the gym the gyms of the future will look like the gyms of the past yeah he called it out you know 25 years ago it's pretty true no because like if you think about the way the gyms progress and the way our gym looks now today this is how it should be and this is probably what like you basically how you lifted in your basement when you were younger, you yeah. know, just like barbell and weights and Opened the space. Yeah, that so was it. Some medicine ball. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. My wife's texting me. No, you're kidding. I'll let you go. Um, what's your favorite quote? You know, I, I heard one the other day that I really like, I really liked that quote. And it was the, the owner of Shake Shack, his grandpa told him, he said, how long are you going to be alive or how long are you going to be dead for? And then the Shake Shack guy said, 
a long, I think a long time. Well, he said a lot longer than you, you'll ever be fucking alive. So you bet you should do what you want, what you're passionate about and do it right now. And so, you know, I kind of, I like that quote because I am passionate about this. There's a, a million other things we could do to make more money, but it's, you know, it's, I, I love the interaction with my clients. I love, you know, being a big part of their lives. I see, I love to see them get better, you yeah, know, lose yeah. weight, get off meds, you know, yeah. and even other stories. You're like, you know, this girl, she's never had a date. She's never had a job. She's going back to school. Now she's got a date, you know, she, now she's engaged. Now she's married, you know, and it's just little, little things that you don't really realize that you were a part of, but yeah. you helped put together. Right. Like you weren't like necessarily the biggest motivator or, or the pinnacle of it, but you were like an inflection point. You yeah, exactly. You were an influencer. What's your favorite activity to do when you're not lifting or exercising? Uh, well, you beer. Know, yeah, I like to drink beers. I like to drink 25 ounce beers. <laughs> the main reason be- in one sip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is this is Utah beer, so it's pretty weak. So it's, it's kind of my hydration source. But no, you know, I, I was kind of late to the game. I, you know, I was working a lot. I didn't get married until I was thirty six, so now I have two little kids, you know, a one year old and a four year old. So that pretty much takes up all my time. Well, it's, it's, the question was, what's your favorite activity? Uh, well, that's my favorite activity: <laughs> drinking beer and hanging well, no, with your family, <laughs> hanging out with my kids, drinking beer right. second, <laughs> hanging out with my wife. You used to be no, first. <laughs> Yeah, my priorities have shifted. <laughs> and with kids and family, much respect. Cool, man. Fuck yeah. Yeah, awesome. This is awesome. Yeah, we'll do this again because seriously, there's plenty of Thanks for listening. We hope you gained something from this episode. Our mission is to help people live their best life, both physically and mentally. Check out thinkfitnesslife.com for additional resources and schedule a complimentary assessment with one of us. We're always here to help.